Hey, good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, and wherever you are in this beautiful world that we live in right now. My name is Jason Cooper. I have a guest today, Graham Owens. Welcome. How are you doing? Very good, Jason. Very good. Thank you for having me. Very happy to be here. Awesome. So, look, a little bit of a synopsis before we go in and deep dive into what you're about and whereabouts you are. Um, mm -hmm. So, use because the mission is to discover the most cutting edge L&D techniques that we use in our businesses today. We want to know companies like yours, how you're dealing with this remote training malarkey that we're all getting involved with. I'm sure you were doing it before anyway, but you know, what's the most pressing topics in 2021 and beyond? So a little bit of synopsis about Graham and uh, I'm sure you're going to highlight it a little bit better than me. I nicked it and nabbed it from your LinkedIn profile. So career spanning 20 years uh, from senior management positions in HR, learning development and operations. So really good eclectic array of different types of experiences and diverse countries that you've worked in, Europe and the Middle East. Uh, you're an entrepreneur, an, ex an entrepreneur, uh, if I can say it correctly, a uh, vast range of experiences, um, lots of wonderful stuff. So again, welcome. So whereabouts are you in the world, uh, Graham? I'm actually living, have been living in Qatar in the Middle East um, for the past, uh, going on nine years now. Wow. Um, came over here in 2012. Um, so so where's Qatar. Your where's your tan? I can't see that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, yeah, I'm still Irish. So, um, I mean, I have two colors. One is white and one is red. So, <laughs> uh, you know, that's, there's nothing in between, quite honestly. So, uh, no, I still, after all these years, don't have a tan. People still ask me the same question every time I go home for holiday. Why, why aren't you tanned? I thought you lived in the desert or somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I do, but uh, you know, we don't we don't live outdoors. Unfortunately, it's too hot. It's uh, it's literally yeah. fifty degrees sometimes during the summer. Wow. Yeah. So, so yeah, I went to Dubai a couple of years ago, and you can see the uh, air conditioned bus stops, which is really unusual. So you go to a bus stop, but you have to go into the bus stop because it's too hot. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's you know it's. It's unimaginable, to be honest. I remember somebody asking me previously how to describe it, and I said, think about it if you went outside and somebody was standing at the end of your road or driveway or um, uh, you know, uh, pathway and had a massive hairdryer and just was blowing it in your face. That's kind of what it feels like uh, during the summer months with the, with the heat and the humidity. Um, it's, it's, something, it's something I've never experienced. Yeah. Um, you, do, you do get used to it. What you do is you, you acclimatize to it in terms of how you live and where you live so we live in shopping centers during the summer and you know, we, we spend i spent an inordinate amount of time in shopping centers with uh, with my wife and kids and yeah. uh, but they're they're, enter, they're entertainment centers as well so they have a they've catered for that life you know so you can literally spend a day there with the kids you know shopping I, and, uh, I suppose you have to so uh it's yeah. It's a different way of life, I can imagine. The winter months are lovely. The winter months, which we are in now, we're in just in January, end of January now. And, you know, the temperatures here are in the, even today, it's like the early 20s. So it's a very pleasant day. That's and like a heat wave over here. I know. <laughs> Compared to, sometimes, honestly, sometimes I, I speak to my parents at home or my siblings and uh, I say to them, you know, it's cold today. And they're like, oh, what, what kind of temperature? And I say, mm, it's uh, 17 or 18. They're like, 17 or 18 and it's cold that's not cold it's minus five here or it's minus six <laughs> so um yeah you do get used to the, the heat but you get used you get too used to it as well so you yeah. feel the cold it's a different mindset and it's a different way of doing things so talking about different ways of doing things to tell me about what you what you're what you're doing now and your sort of your sure. where where you're at uh in terms of your l d function sure yeah um Briefly, I suppose, you know, like you said, I've been in the area of L&D and HR for about 20 years now. Um, worked in a vast range of different companies and different industries. I've been very fortunate to work in different locations as well. Um, came out to the Middle East uh, as a posting from a previous employer uh, to head up a HR function for the region. And was an uh, electrical engineering company. And, um, you know, learned a lot about how HR operates in this region and, and uh, across countries and, um, you know, in terms of dealing with the, the people issues. 
Um, then I did a stint at consulting with uh, another Irish company and um, kind of went out and did a lot of kind of strategic HR consulting for a number mm -hmm. of years. Um, and, and then, you know, one of the things I guess that, you know, had a big impact on, on my career as a consultant was the, uh, the um, barricade or the blockade that happened here in mm -hmm. 2017, which, oh, wow. you know, all of, the, yeah, all of the local countries here were effectively restricted to us. So I, did, I, was, I had clients in the UAE, in Bahrain, in, um, in Oman, and, mm. you know, getting to them now, uh, you know, was very difficult. And uh, so anyway, I also had a young family, so I decided to uh, come back to Qatar and um, I was traveling back and forth between the uh -huh. different places. And it's, it's very doable here. It's 20, 30 minutes flight, you know, to, to, uh, to Dubai or to Abu Dhabi. So it was, it was very manageable, but uh, when the blockade happened, then it meant you had to go a very long route to get back home. And uh, as I said, we had two two small children and another one since then. So yeah. effectively, I, I came back, and uh, one of the clients I had been working with in Qatar approached me to um, to head up their uh, learning development function. So it was a company I was familiar with. Yeah, it was a company. It's uh, Nakilat, which is the the shipping arm of uh, Qatar Petroleum, basically, or Qatar Gas. Um, so we ship all the gas around the world that uh, Qatar produces uh, to all mm -hmm. our clients in uh, Japan, in Europe, America, and uh, the Middle East and the Far East. So, so you've got a global audience of people that you work with now. Is that, is that right? And how, how yeah, do you uh, facilitate to that? And what, what's been the sort of the changes that you've seen over the last few years, especially the last year? Anyway, uh, if you can sort of describe that for me. It's, look, it's, it's, it's a year like no other. It's been a year of immense challenges for every business, and, and there's no business unaffected by it, I don't believe. And in, whether that's positively affected or negatively affected, you know, in some cases, it's been a very positive thing, especially in the online retail sectors. I mean, yeah. they have exploded, um, you know, and Amazon and, and all these companies. So, you know, I mean, it has been, hasn't been all negative, but for, for every company, they've had to adjust to how to manage people in this climate and with working from home um that reality you know a lot of companies had flirted i would say with the idea mm -hmm. of working from home and remote working and flexible arrangements and some would do it had been doing it better than others my own company we had you know had dipped our toe in the water i would say of working from home and flexible working uh, but it wasn't the norm and then suddenly overnight everybody was at home and um you know we all just had to kind of adjust and, you know, we did. And the company responded very well and, um, you know, supported employees to work from home, um, you know, and, and embraced it for, for, for all the positives that it had. Um, I guess from an L&D perspective, let's say, um, from how do you deliver training when you can't gather in, <laughs> in person? That's the challenge. So we, we very quickly kind of circled the wagons, uh, myself and the team, and, we looked at what can we do in this new scenario and you know it does force you to be innovative it does force you to be kind of um you know think outside the box a little bit yes. and but i think the time that was in it allowed for that as well because everybody was thinking outside the box everyone was um challenged with new ways of doing things so in actual fact it broke down some of the traditional boundaries for us in how we deliver mm -hmm. our so we switched to a, a basically a virtual model practically over the course of a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. um, we, whatever courses we could deliver virtually, we, we approached the providers. In some cases, we worked with the providers to develop them virtually so that our staff could take them. We yeah. also um, introduced the concept of master classes and webinars and uh, uh, you know online tutorials. And then we did our own internal um, uh, program which you know we, we titled nice but it was basically looking at the internal capabilities we had in our own organization and mm -hmm. hosting those um on a monthly basis so we had nearly one every week where we had professionals from around the business um giving a one hour virtual um presentation and interactive session with our staff on a vast range of topics um and things that from a you know, people are working one aspect of a business. They don't necessarily know about the other aspects. You know, um, you could be in the finance department or the legal department, mm -hmm. and you don't know what goes on in HR or what goes on in the operations. And 
um, because you're busy just doing your own job and you know your piece yeah. of the puzzle. But um, the, the key thing for me was that the, the staff were very willing and open to doing it. Um, we had, thankfully, the technology to do it. We had the platforms in-house to do it. And uh, from that perspective, a lot of the big pieces were in place, if, if, if you know what I mean. So mm -hmm. um, we just switched our focus to virtual. Um, in fact, in, in fact uh, by the end of the year, we had actually delivered more training courses than we had in the previous year. Oh, that's good. I, I, yeah, I know, because I was doing the end of year reports and I think you know, we actually did about 20% more courses. Um, and the funny thing was we had we had a little bit less in terms of hours, but that would that would logically follow because of the nature of online. It's it's a faster uh, delivery mechanism than you have in face to face because with face to face you're building in breaks, you're building in yep. you know nine to five and an hour for lunch and two 30 minute breaks and so on. And and people tend to make a day of it if you like, you know. Um, yeah, that, they, yeah. They, they they package it into day segments. Whereas with online, you can do two hours and it's just two hours, you know, and uh, you can cram a lot into two hours um, with, with the way technology is nowadays with breakout rooms and whatnot. So we found it a very efficient model actually to deliver what we needed to. Um, the biggest surprise, if, if, if I made the biggest surprise that I found was how open people had suddenly become to online and virtual learning, uh -huh. which previously I, I had you know, long, arduous conversations with several of the senior managers saying, we want to deliver X program, there's an online version. No, 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 they need to go on, they need to do it. And they, wouldn't, yeah. they wouldn't learn very well online. No, no, can, you know, can we send them to Singapore or can we send them to wherever the course might be happening? Even if it but was happening. A lot of money's been saved over this time. And yeah. what's actually happened from my experience <clears> now is everyone's like, the future was the future of work and the future of everything was like five years time, 2025, but it's actually happened so quickly. What other challenges have you faced in sort of learning and getting the best out of uh, the, the staff? Because they, the staff want to be engaged, but they want to be engaged with the technology. We do, uh, as our brains are wired and fired together, we t tend to drift off and then we look at the sky and uh, or look out the window, or whatever it might be. Um, so what, what other challenges were you facing with that uh, sort of in-depth learning? Absolutely no, no different to anyone else, uh, Jason. We had the same challenges in, in the initially because I guess we adapted, or not we, but the people uh, that were providing training adapted the same approach, it just flipped it to a virtual platform, mm -hmm. which is not what actually works. If you're, if you're delivering it in person, the, the previous platform worked perfectly well. And, and it was very engaging and everything else. But if you just try to take that and do it in front of a, a webcam, you know, with a PowerPoint and, and uh, you know, a couple of uh, facilitated sessions, it doesn't work. So yeah. what, what, our, what our challenge was to get our trainers and our, um, our um, consultants to design it for a virtual platform. So that meant that doing things that were different than the way they would have done it previously and to make sure that everybody around the room, the virtual room, was engaged and was had something to keep them engaged, you know? Yeah. yeah. And so that, you know, like breakout rooms were used an awful lot more regularly than uh, had previously been done than you would do in a physical session. You might do it once or twice, you know, in a physical um, training event, but every every five or ten minutes there was tiny miniature breakout rooms where people were constantly talking and engaging coming that back was one of my back. questions actually is that how do you yeah. create that atmosphere to make people yeah. engaged and learn but it's also to embed the learning within the the, the unconscious the subconscious mind and mm. after that the so leading question is is what's the follow-up how, how do you adapt to that so you've got the learning you've done the learning you've done the, uh, the workshop or whatever what happens after that it's and it's the same with any training event. It's the application to reality. It's the it's the taking the knowledge and applying it to your reality. And the the, the pragmatist learners in the group will love that because that's how they learn. They yeah. they take that theory and they go, well, how does it work in my reality? Yeah. And and that's what you do. So you know the action learning sets after training events are very important. And we also then did follow up sessions. So we had a you know maybe a, a two or three hour session on on. Uh, particular topic 
and then we'll reconvene uh, you know at the same time in so next week to do a feedback session having given them things to do in between virtually in pairs or in groups and that really worked well because there was a touch point back in again and you know human nature being what it is if you're expecting you know expected to come back with something you, you do <laughs> you know you, yeah yeah you, we did, yeah you know you have that conversation and you say you know yeah we talked about it and this is what we found and this is how i dealt mm -hmm. with it so we always try to bring it back to reality so that it's ingrained in you know that whole piece around transfer of learning so yeah. from the classroom to the boardroom or from the classroom to the to the office bringing that back into your 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 environment is, is critically important mm -hmm. um so that's and that's one of the i think the key things with any learning event to be honest with you i mean knowledge somebody once told me about you know the difference between what what they learned when they went started to work and you know when you have a degree you think the world is just going to want to you know employ you because of all the knowledge you have right mm -hmm. and somebody said to me you know it's not it, people don't employ you for what you know they employ you for what you can do with what you know yeah and it's it's, it's you know it's true for learning as well, for training courses you're not the knowledge is fantastic to have but if you don't apply it yep what you know what benefit is the organization getting out of it i think and, that's and yeah. those laws isn't it of uh, behavior it's how how you do it but then you can learn it and if you don't use it you lose it and there's a, a thing in uh, i think it's something like after 24 hours if you don't use it 50 percent uh, of it's gone so gone. you have to another, another straight away. Gone in 48 hours yeah so you know and, and the thing is about you know the, one of the key um, things we tried to, to build into our virtual program was harnessing the knowledge that people got on training by asking them to bring it back into the organization and dispense it. So if you, you know, somebody, you know, if you want to, somebody to really ingrain something very, very much inside them, ask them to teach somebody else. Yeah. Because then they, they know that they're, they're expected to be able to dispense this knowledge, their level of attention increases dramatically so as much as possible and it isn't always possible but as much as possible we tried to say to any of the, the the staff that were going on training programs look this is fundamentally very important to the business it's critically important to you but it's good for mm -hmm. other people so would you come back in and run a nice session on this training event that you're going to go to maybe it's two days or whatever it might be and uh, you know by and large they were open to it so they came back and said shared their knowledge and you know you could see that they really paid attention because they knew they were in the back of their mind they're going to have to come in and explain explain this to other people and uh, so it was a very good tool to uh, to get them to, to that engagement levels up all the all the time you know yeah that's uh, that's uh, again that's uh, one of the core principles about learning is to teach others once you can teach others uh, you've actually got it in uh, in the head uh, yeah. so Based on that, how do you learn and grow yourself and sort of pivot with the technology that's around you so you can give the best performance that you can possibly do so everyone learns uh, or grows because it's all about you, you really, or you and your team? It is, yeah. I mean, we're no different. I mean, and sometimes it's like the cobbler's shoes, right? You, you, you're so busy making sure everybody else gets their training programs and make sure that they're developed and they're on their, their, their development journeys. You kind of sometimes lose yourself in that so we are conscious of that too from our own perspective so we've we've our team engages regularly in you know updates and we we, we tune into a lot of um a lot of free material to be honest and yeah. about, about the you know the, the cutting edge uh, technologies that are out there we have a good network as well of consultants around the, the globe that we we deal with from different aspects and you know they're very they're very generous in some cases in sharing uh, later techniques and knowledge with us as well and, you know, I think most people, uh, and speaking, this is a huge generalization, of course, but a lot of people, I think, when they work in this area, they're naturally inclined to learn themselves. Yeah, of they're, course. they're inclined to acquire knowledge. They enjoy that process. They, you know, they, they read books, they read um, the latest, uh, you know, uh, gurus on whatever topic it might mm -hmm. be, whether it's, you know, or even the, some of the classics, you know, the Coveys and the, the, the you know, Dale Carnegie's and, and so yep. on. You know, they, they'll all have read these books, you know, and they, they don't necessarily need to, but they're interested. And, you know, so I'm lucky that the team I have is a very engaged team as well. And um, they're, they're, they're very, um, they're very keen to, to, you know, keep ahead, if you like, mm -hmm. you know, 
push the boundaries forward all the time. And so looking at ahead is uh, taking that and taking your words with you, but looking ahead, uh, how do you now look ahead and what do you see? Maybe the challenges, maybe the opportunities for 2021, but maybe mm. think beyond, uh, maybe you have to think beyond 2021 now mm. because uh, uh, we're still in the same position as we were last March. I know. And I, I really wouldn't have thought that were the case, you know, at the, at the beginning. I really, we all thought this would be finished by September. I mean, we, yeah. were, we were hearing all sorts of things. So, and now because so many milestones or potential milestones have passed, we kind of, nobody really believes anything now until it's actually announced, you know. So, um, no, for me, I mean, looking forward, it's it's about consolidating what we did, I guess, uh, to a large extent, Jason, uh, in 2020. And I wouldn't say we got it perfectly right in 2020. We reacted on the fly. Uh, we tried things. Some worked, some didn't work. But the things that did work, we need to build on those now. And um, so for us, one of the, the key, if I, if, I, if I made the key, I suppose, advantage or good takeaways from this whole pandemic area is that now we do have the opportunity to actually blend learning. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it was, a, it was a phrase that was bandied around the L&D uh, world yeah. for many years, the blended learning approach. And yes, you know, some companies did do it very well. A lot of companies tried to do it, didn't or couldn't. Um, and, and I would count myself among those. You know, we, we tried to get it off the ground. We got a little bit into it but people still reverted back to type. And um, and I suppose in the Middle East as well, it's different uh, It's different culturally, it's different uh, to a different stage of development as well than Europe or the US. But what we found now is that, you know, we're pushing open doors when we're talking about, you know, bringing on, on stream a virtual university next year. And, um, wow. you know, and it's something that I experienced very early on in my career with, um, with an insurance company that I worked with in Dublin. And that was, it's what, 15, 17 years ago or 18 years ago, there was a virtual university. Mm -hmm. And now I'm, you know, hopefully going to bring it into play next year uh, for the company. And that's going to be totally virtual. It's a totally virtual space with um, delivery being uh, all online, a blended approach of, you know, practical assessments, internal training, technical mm -hmm. training, plus personal effectiveness, leadership, and, and um, also some interpersonal skills. So, like any university, it'll be, there'll be streams, modules, and we'll build a matrix in within that space. And it's going to be completely hosted on our LMS uh, platform. Wow. So, yeah, That's I mean, cool. if, I had, if somebody said to me 12 months ago, you know, um, you know, next in 2021, you'll have a virtual, I would have said, no, this company's years away from that. Or, you know, this, we're not there yet. But mm -hmm. this whole pandemic has really accelerated that. And now it's, yeah, why not? Yeah, because we've all experienced we've had to. Um, and people are now open to it. And they see the benefit of it, you know. Um, so from from an L, my L&D perspective, solely being selfish, it's probably been a positive because now it gives us that flexibility, that um, that option to, to move into that space much more rapidly than we would have otherwise. And do you think now um, if... COVID sort of disappeared over the next couple of months, uh, yeah. probably over, if it did, hypothetically, mm. what do you think the balance will be now? What do you, do you think yeah. is going to be a more blended approach or more online or less, I, less in the real world? Do you know, it, it's probably a difference of perspectives as well. I'd say from a management perspective and from a leadership of a, of a company's perspective, that they would prefer to continue with the virtual because you're, it's a much more economical model to, it to dispense. It really is. And, and you know, the, the, the myths around its effectiveness at times were bandied about as being not as effective as the in-person and you don't have the facilitation and the learning from others. But we now know from the technology and the way we can interact that we can, of course, have that uh, yeah. facilitation. And it, it's a more efficient model. So when you when you eliminate costly flights and um, costly hotels and accommodation and, and yeah. logistics around organizing that and all the rest of it, then it's it's immediately a feasible, a much more feasible model for management. On the employee yeah. side, of course, I mean, <laughs> the, the irony it's is, when people, yeah, when employees come out of this lockdown, they'll be dying to go somewhere, anywhere <laughs> for, a, yeah. for a training course or anything else. And, and there will be, a, you know, a certain degree of, uh, you know, you know, 
a balance, I think a rebalancing of, of how we deliver um, the programs we deliver. There is certainly, I'm not for a second saying there isn't a benefit to in, in person, in classroom based training, there certainly is. And for some courses, it's actually critical, it's crucial. You need to do mm -hmm. practical demonstrations or, or practical, yeah. uh, you know, um, practice. But, you know, in some cases, you know, it was just the tried and trusted model and the people were familiar with and enjoyed and it was used extensively. So now I think we may get to the actual holy grail of the blended learning approach now. Yeah. Having gone completely one way um, and been forced to go totally virtual, they will come back. I'm sure it'll come back in certain areas yeah. to a more inclusive and a more face-to-face -face or, or interactive uh, thing. But I think the, the, the world has shifted and it's not going to necessarily just tilt back onto the same axis it was before. Um, I think no, yeah, it's habit, have a uh, habit, have a uh, habit, no, no pun intended there, but you get used to what you've been in the online world now. So it's, uh, I can be sitting at home and people are probably being more comfortable as much as I still like to be in front of people. And we, we as humans are chemically engineered people and we're a sociable creature. So we do need elements of that, but I think it, I don't know, from my point of view, I think it would probably be maybe 60, 40 or even 70, 30. Yeah. I don't know, but and that's whatever the blend. works. Yeah. That's the blend you're looking for. Um, you know, where before it was probably 80, 20, and that wasn't really blended. It was, you know, it was the old and trusted and traditional with a little bit of e-learning, which was yeah. typically your standard suite of e-learning courses, self-directed, self-taught learning. Um, now it's the... And again, like what we're doing even today is, you know, podcasts and it's about a conversation virtually uh, with mm -hmm. people all over the world. Now it's it's possible. It's it's people are open to it. Um, you can now deliver a training program virtually without very much in the way of technology. You know, mm -hmm. a, a basic laptop with a basic uh, webcam and the platforms are there. They're free. If, they're free of charge. Most yep. of them. So now, you know, and, and as I said, People are now used to it, and they're they're used to this um, this way of communicating, and it works. It does. One, work. one, one last question for you before we finish up this awesome uh, interview uh, podcast. Uh, um, one bit of golden nugget of L and D gem that you can sort of feed forward. I don't want to. Uh, don't want to know your the the whole element of it, but one sort of golden nugget which is like bang, you can take that and learn on that straight away. Well, um, I'm, I'm, do you mean as in an area within L and D? Yeah, L an area. Uh, however, you want to perceive it, really. It's a sort of an open question, really. So you, you can pick any part of it. Uh, look, I mean, to be honest, there's an awful lot out there. If you're if you're an individual person, um, you know, looking to develop yourself, let's say, looking to add to your your repertoire of skills or knowledge. There's so many free resources out there right now. It's incredible. Um, it's never been so plentiful. Um, but from an, from an, as an organization, if you're looking at terms of how do I engage people, development is still a critical retention strategy um, in any organization. In fact, you know, as, as the world gets smaller, it becomes more important because you've got, the, you've got the situation now where you could have in the future people being hired virtually all over yep. the world. So you could be sitting in Hong Kong, for, you know, conceivably, and being hired by an Irish company, and never actually meet your colleagues, you know, um, and, and and contribute effectively to the team, uh, the way work can be structured now. So, from an, from an organization's perspective, they still need that person to feel as though they're part of their culture, and the culture yeah. is the. I think the key thing for any organization going forward is how do I build the culture I want. Yeah. based on the values of the organization of course how do i build that in the virtual space where people don't have that tact tactile you know interaction you know mm -hmm. the things you know people are going the companies are going to have to be creative about it but it is it is going to be a challenge for companies um to do that and and they're going to be have to be very creative about that and that's something it's for, it's interesting space actually um and and i guess you know coupled with that is how do i maintain well-being Mm -hmm. in a virtual world you know and, and how, right to disconnect you know uh which you hear a lot about now is you know where people are working from home they feel almost guilty if they're not logged on to their computer 
or mm-hmm. you know where you're you know previously and again I'm, I'm going off topic a little bit here but previously you could leave your office for a meeting and somebody could come to your office or ring your office and you're not there yeah. and they, this is perfectly fine you know they leave a message or you know whatever but now when you're not there virtually you come back to your pc you know you feel you have to kind of almost give a reason why you weren't yeah. there on another yeah, meeting. Yeah. you know and you're explaining as if you know they might think you were I don't know, sitting in front of the TV or, or lying down, or something, <laughs> you know, that's, that's, a, that's a different dynamic, you know, and, and yeah. you know, and people also, you know, how people interact with each other in the physical world is different because, you know, if the office is closed and locked, you're gone home, they go, okay, it'll wait till tomorrow. But now it's five o'clock or six o'clock and they want to know something. Then, well, let's just check if he's online, you know, and, and you, know, they, yeah. you know, and there's the kind of almost like you're being spied upon and then, they approach you to to do something, uh, whereas they wouldn't do it in a physical world, you know. So those kinds of challenges are what organizations are going to have to build policies around for HR. I think so. Yeah. You know, and but they did they had to do that for every other significant change in industry. I think it should filter down, but I know some companies that I like big companies that I know uh, in Dublin, Europe or wherever, they have a policy five o'clock or half past five, everything switches off. So they insist that people look mm. after their mind and look after their well-being. Mm. You work, you come into work, and you know you're there between nine and five thirty or whatever it might be. But mm. after that, you switch off, and everyone switches off. If the customer, uh, obviously not customer service, but for the main bulk of the people, they just switch off. And I think that's a policy mm. moving forward. And I think that's a good for the brain. Mm. It's good for the well-being. Because you don't want to be stuck in front of the. I, I've just got glasses because before I didn't need glasses, but now it's all a blur. So, uh, yeah, yeah. And so it's true. It's true, yeah. I, uh, I really thank you for your time today, and uh, we're almost over time. So, like, it's been an awesome conversation. I really appreciate your time. Uh, you've been such a great input to this first of uh, Use Because Grown Professionals uh, podcast. And you've been phenomenal. You've given so much and so much golden nuggets. Uh, We all thank you. My name's Jason Cooper. and Thank you, Graham Owens. You're very welcome. Thank you so much, Jason. I appreciate it. Lovely to talk to you.